Okay, so I have a few relatively connected things that I just wanted to talk about based on kind of like annoyances that like come up in practice when doing some BPF applications, usually like some sort of tooling and observability. Uh, the first one is the hash map requires precising it, which very often it's like impossible to, to have a proper size, especially when you don't know about the workload or you don't control the workload. So like recently this problem came up like when I was working on like the USDT support in dbpf and that requires some BPF side. And like on the BPF side we had map. And that map is actually like scaling with the amount of like USDTs that user, uh, user application connects, right? Like there is no way for me as a like library maintainer to know like what would be the appropriate size. So uh, having some solution that allows to bypass this by saying we just don't require uh, pre-allocated size and stuff like that and just like do allocations as we need it would be awesome. And the first slide is kind of to remind John Fastaban, his talk from last LSFMM that he was experimenting with using our hash table <laughs> based map. So maybe we should just re revive this, maybe like benchmark it a little bit more and see if it's worth uh, adding as a separate, uh, separate map. Uh, and this is the slide from, from that presentation that it shows that like, so I think the yellow one, right, is the, the resize. I don't even know what underscore reuses, to be honest. I, I, I forgot, but. I can be quick. Yellow was like if you just like literally put BPF operations over to over the top of the RC uh, resizable hash table, and then green was like went into the R resizable hash table and fixed up a lot of this, like improved just the core data structure in the kernel. Yeah, so green looks good. Green did look better. If yes. you can do that, then I think <laughs> it's it's a pretty good alternative to the hash map, and I think we should do that, right? So uh, I highly encourage. I can tell you what I ended up doing instead of this is we just started allocating giant blocks of, of memory and just like in a map. So you'd like map pre-allocate with, with, the, with the no pre-alloc. But then, and so you make that very big because it doesn't take up lots of memory. And then every time you need a new block, block, you just get a new entry from the hash, from that. For, for, sorry, we do like in a, yeah, you get a new entry from there and that, Entry causes an alloc, but instead of doing it for every object you actually have, you would just get like, put, shove like 100 elements inside of a single hash entry and then sort of do some accounting, but I'm not sure that makes any sense. The, the four minus lap. Yes. It's all good, but it's probably like not a very <laughs> usability friendly solution for like generic data structure in like BPF world, right? But, but anyway, I think like th this, is, this is one good direction. Uh, it's probably not the only direction. So the other alternative is like just use a very different conceptual implementation of the lookup table, which hash map is like lookup table, right? Like it's a generic data structure. And like one of those is well known red black tree. And guess what Meta is working on doing that as a, as a map. So we might might have red black tree as a BPF map soon, which would be great, right? It it. I suspect it might have quite a high uh, memory overhead overall, especially when the values are small. So there will be trade-offs. Uh, but this is one alternative. Yeah, John? Yeah, uh, it's a generic question. Like, at some point, like, all of this can be done inside BPF and you don't need a map for it, right? Like, we have the U-pointer stuff coming and we have, like, the ability to alloc. Like, could this start to move into, like, a library? Yeah, so, well, right, so that's so far what we're debating, whether it will be will look more like a map or it will be distilled to really kernel-like uh, helpers where it won't look like a map anymore. Like, it, pretty much everything will be explicit in a program. It's, well, still TBD. <laughs> I, I think there will be some, like, usability challenges for, like, basic computer science data structure, like to, to always have to re implement it in pure BPF. And like, besides the usability issues, like the memory overhead. So like, for example, for like malloc DIN pointer, right? Like, 
malloc did pointer, right? We have to store ref count. We have to store some additional metadata, which you can completely avoid if you implement it in the kernel. So I'm pretty sure with like all the like BPF loop and din pointer, we will be able to uh, to implement something like uh, red black tree. But I would still argue that like we need something that's like lean and mean inside the BPF itself as like a proper BPF map for convenience and performance and efficiency. Have you, have you looked at, we have the like, um, what is it, the prefix? I always forget what the map is called. We already have a map for like LPM. IPs. LPM? Yeah, yeah oh, LPM's yeah, there, which is almost this, except for it, it, it kind of wants data sizes that are like IPs. Well, that's a, that's a good segue that like, there are still alternatives to red, black tree, and uh, it's like the general class of tri-based uh, implementations, right? Uh, this is the best picture I found on Wikipedia. I don't think it actually gives you any insight in how it actually works, but the idea is that you have sort of like a multi-children node, right? And uh, you, s you basically like logic is sp split your key into uh, chunks, and then like split points define like how many like how much branching you do and all the stuff. It's, I mean, classic try. Uh, the, the, the trivial implementation that is like really trivial, it's just like super memory hungry. So in practice, no, I don't think anyone is doing it like as a real try. They, they usually have like some compressed try implementation. And uh, like in this talk, I wanted to highlight one, one specific implementation that I came, came uh, well, it came up like during, I don't know, some, some searches. Uh, it's called QP try. Uh, which, according to everything I read, and according to some recent upstream trials between like the QP try and uh, there was like this ternary search tree for like more efficient uh, string storage, like if, if they share a, a bunch of like uh, common prefixes, it seems like the QP try actually stands up pretty well, despite like having like having no special optimizations for like common prefix and all that stuff. Uh, so it would be really interesting to try that. Uh, and I have some numbers from like some uh, blog posts. Someone, uh, so like what, what the author of this, this benchmark did, like they took 200 megabyte uh, text basically like with some words and tried to like build a lookup table based on all the words. Uh, and, and like, yeah. And so, he benchmarked like four different implementations. Radix tree, crit bit tree is, is kind of like QP tree, but like less memory efficient because it, it like at every node it branches like only two ways while QP try actually like uses clever tricks how to store like multiple pointers compactly uh, and like red black tree, right? So, and it, according to that benchmark, right? Like the QP tree stands up against red black tree very nicely in terms of like memory usage and even performance. It's one of the benchmarks, I don't know. Uh, but so far it looked very promising and like the idea is pretty simple, implementation is pretty simple, so it shouldn't be too hard to try to fit it into the BPF uh, like ecosystem basically. Uh, the, the good property of the QP try versus like the, the recently uh, like discussed uh, ternary search tree is that this thing like QP try doesn't, uh, doesn't attempt to split the key. Like it, the, the key as, as it's allocated is still like a blob of memory, which makes it nicely fitting into like BPF map uh, element iterator and all this stuff. Because like once you start splitting key into like distinct uh, pieces of memory, it just you cannot really iterate it because like even if you can, like how do you provide the memory to the program? So basically QP try seems to be like a pretty nice, uh, you know, stand in uh, implementation uh, like for, for ordered map. So, Regardless what, whether we do red, black tree, or QP3, or both, uh, it would be good to have some, uh, some implementation that doesn't assume like predefined maximum size or preallocated size. And in addition, we also get ability to have like ordered uh, iteration, right? So like if you, if you add some helpers to like get next key, so we have this from like syscall uh, side, but like if you get it like from BPF side with extended loop support and all this stuff, now you can, you can actually traverse your data structure inside the BPF program uh, you know, like as, as, as you need it according to your logic. So uh, one, one topic that I wanted to touch on, because it, it like, when I think about like implementing some new map, oh, 
Yeah, go ahead. And, but before you get too far off of the topic of uh, uh, resizable uh, maps and things, um, correct me if you already have it or whatever, but I think the same thing you'd want for things like stack and queue maps, right? To, where you can't necessarily predict what the size is going to be ahead of time if you want dynamically resizable ones. I don't think you have that right now, right? I know we don't on the Windows side. I don't think it's on Linux either, right? It's, you got to know the stack or queue depth, the maximum size up front, and then if if you have a, a peak that you almost never use, right, then you're having to over-allocate, right? Yeah, we don't have that. And yeah, yeah. But to be honest, I haven't seen anyone using Q and stack much. Because like, they are so simple that you can actually implement them on, a, on a, like a block of, blob, blob of memory, basically. Yeah, it goes back to the discussion that we were having about you know, dine pointers and stuff. Is that something that you just want uh, to leave it up to the programs, that you put it into a library, or you uh, optimize the map itself, right? And is there any performance difference? I don't know. Is there a making programs easier to write, whoever talk that was, right? And so at least a library might be useful. But my point is that maybe hash map isn't the only thing to look at, even if it's the top one to look at. So uh, I have one uh, question. Um, so regarding the, like the stack and, and Q map, for example, I. I haven't seen it used in practice, but in, in general, like I mean, the maximum element size there is we did that b because of the of the R limit, right? There was no particular other reason, and now it's all converted to the MemCG accounting. And could we actually lift that limit? Maybe it makes sense. Maybe I mean, also for hash table and others. I mean, who cares if the if the user screws it up? Then I don't know. Maybe it could be an option at least. Well, yeah, the limit, all of this limit started because we were hoping, we didn't know about that spectral meltdown will be invented. Uh, we thought like unprioritized VPF would be reality and all of these limits everywhere were specifically for that reason. Now, yeah, everything is root, so like max entries don't make sense that much anymore. <laughs> I mean, like at least for like hash map, it's not that trivial to like do resizing, especially when you have the hash map working in an MI, right? So it, it's not just like accounting limitation, it's it's implementation, similar for stack, right? Like the, the model that the BPF maps have like with regard to concurrency, right? It's like sort of like lockless on read and like you, you don't want to pay the price of like locking if you do not have to and like with the resize you have to lock basically or like do some very clever maybe schema of like atomic replacement. So this is definitely not a trivial like let's just remove these limitations. Like let's think through like how we can even like support this. And with the same I'm semantics. I'm not sure whether you have a slide about sleepable stuff because for sleepable we still can only pre-allocate which kind of does not make sense at all. Like, sleepable is supposed to be able to use KML like always because we're sleepable not only GFP atomic, like normal uh, hash maps, but GFP kernel would be just fine too. But the whole thing is there because uh, map lookups are CU protected and sleepable programs, they are CU trace. So there's still something to be addressed. I don't have it on my slides, but I wanted to touch on like, how can we generalize like not caring, like as a, as a implementing some map, like how can I not care whether I'm in sleepable or not sleepable mode? Like the, this trick that we do with uh, the G, GFP flags, right? Like can we somehow fetch it from the context based on like whether we are running as a sleepable or not and stuff like that. But I don't have it on the slides, it's just topic for discussion. But basically like the way that like we do, so recent changes to uh, so socket, socket local storage, or was that? Yes, yeah. it, it's like it requires like verifier magic explicit code, right? Like to, to pass this extra argument. It's it works. It's super magical. It kind of takes work, and like it would be nice if like if we can have something like what what we have with run context, right? It's like this ambient thingy, like where you can like ask like, oh, what's what's in the context right now? So maybe maybe we could do something like that for like sleepable versus non sleepable too. So I think like Paul, we we tried making it like not caring about sleepable and non-sleepable in like so, uh, local storage maps. The issue is the, the synchronization part of like the, the, the RCU stuff, a uh, call RCU task trace, it was, it was causing performance impact. But Paul McKenney says that he's working on some patches. And once we get, once we like run a few benchmarks there and those patches work, maybe we could generalize all of that. All right, so getting back to NMI. 
my favorite topic. So, uh, you know, some some people who like don't don't have to do like perf event stuff. They don't usually care about NMI, but like performance profiling usually happens in NMI, at least like the some portion of it. Uh, and like the problem with all these like new maps that I'm proposing to add, right? That like would do like dynamic memory allocations. That it, it's kind of hard, if not forbidden, to do memory allocations in NMI, which almost immediately rules out the use of those new maps in NMI. And like the question sort of I have is like, can we do anything about that? Because it doesn't seem like we can realistically preallocate stuff for RB3 or for QP try without like. It's like arbitrary hitting some limits, right? Because like we didn't anticipate some pattern. Of <laughs> oh, when I, when I gave the resizable hash table, you suggested having a cache of objects, so maybe you could cache a set of pre-allocated stuff, but not the entire. But how much do you cache? Well, you make up some number. Maybe it'll work. But yeah, that's the problem. You make up some numbers, and it will it yeah. will work with some workloads, and like will will not work with others. So uh, for for this, uh, if we also realize that right now all of the maps there are two modes, like either everything is preallocated or everything allocated dynamically. So we're thinking to add a new operation potentially to all map types that will be allocate like n elements, and then the actual like update will be you only like malloc free. So this hybrid mode. And then, like, if you're like, careful and know what you're doing, then you will allocate the allocate the elements in the context where you can. And like in NMI, you will just do update, and then it just like grabs this cached buffers, cached elements. Like if you can say like I want to extend this map. But you still realize, right? Like it's first, like it's kind of complicated. Like it depends on the workload. It uh, it still can fail because you didn't anticipate a spike in workload and stuff like that. So having, so I know, like one of the ideas, right? Like as an alternative, just like having to preallocate. Because like even if you like, so be before I go to that, right? Like for QP try, for example, like even if I knew that like I need like up to one million elements, right? It still is impossible to correctly preallocate everything. Because the size of the node for QP try, for example, is different, right? Like it, it can have like two childrens and like up to sixteen or something children, right? Uh, so like even if, when you know like I need million nodes, like do you do you preallocate like the maximum possible size? Then like you're wasting memory, and like do you do like some average? Then like it, it starts becoming on like becoming dependent on like some distribution of like your data. So it just just having to think about this is kind of maddening. I would say, because I don't want to think about this. Like in user space, you don't you don't care, right? You just like let's add element and it has to allocate, and if it didn't allocate, then well, too bad. Like it's a, uh, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking like how I can bypass any of my uh, limitations, and like what one possible solution I think is just like to. Offload the workload basically. So like do the minimal amount of stuff like capture, I don't know, stack trace, like some context, store it in like some pre-allocated per CPU memory or whatever. And then like if you need to populate hash maps and stuff like that, just offload that work into different BPF program or into callback, right? Like I don't remember like what we decided about like IRQ work queue, but like if we had something like that and we could just like schedule something to to run like at earliest possible opportunity in, in a little bit more permissive context, that would be good. Uh, alternatively, and I'll be talking about this a little bit later, is if and once we have BPF ring buffer that allows kernel program to talk, basically to send data to another kernel program, right, BPF program, then like you can use that as like a queue of work for, for the program that runs like in more permissive uh, context. So I see that as like one of the ways of bypassing an MI limit. Just like do minimal pre preallocated basically fixed amount of work and then like do everything else somewhere else. In in, in approach two with the work queue stuff, this is handled by the by the framework itself. On the kernel to kernel ring buff, I, are you are you saying that the map allocation like how how would that So I'll get I'll get to the kernel to kernel ring buffer, but basically the idea is that like you'll have some your your program on the other on the other side of the BPF ring buffer that will be called for every submitted record, uh -huh. 
and that will be running somewhere and like we'll get to like where it can run and there you can do what you, what you can do like even with like sleepable sleepable mode right so just like get out of NMI basically but like preserve enough state to to do something useful that that's the idea uh, but like kind of like to wrap it up, right? Like the, the problem was like adding new data structures, like they're all fancy, they're all promising like good numbers and all stuff, but like only in some cases, depending on the workload. And like it's really hard to make a good decision when you don't really have good benchmarks. So I think like while it's probably not the sexiest and like most exciting work, like we need to invest more in having like good, more or less representative uh, benchmarks for like for hash maps, you know, like typical kinds of data structures. That, so that would be great. Like we have sort of like benchmark framework, uh, but like we need to simulate some workloads, right? Like load KL sims and, and stuff like that. So like we, we, we did it ad hoc previously, but if you had some something that you can just like, oh, I have new experimental data structures that like I want to develop, like I'll just plug into the existing set of uh, data sets and like uh, of benchmarks and I'll see how, how it fares against the existing implementation. So, so it's sort of like call to action. Maybe someone is excited about writing benchmarks. Do it. The I'll be happy, uh, okay no, no, to, to review, review that, yes. <laughs> so I think the, the, it, it's a good point about benchmarks. It's, it's, it'll be nice to have like some representative uh, workloads there. For example, arc v copying, right? For BPF ring buffer, if we uh, implement something using uh, like and have a, a measure how much time does it take to copy a large arc v or like a large amount of processes that have spawned at a given time or compile the kernel and then see how much time does it take to like, how much overhead does a logging program add on top of that. That would be a nice sort of overall benchmark, but it won't micro benchmark the ring buffer, but it will sort of focus on the ring buffer aspects because that's what it is built around. Yeah, the problem is it's hard to simulate realistic workloads without having just like production traffic and stuff, so. But, for this particular case, the realistic workload is like it, it gets stressed under heavy command execution, right? So the realistic, the, mm -hmm. the, the end game for this particular case is the is a kernel compile or the worst, a Clang compile, right? This is where it really, uh, you have really large command lines on, on Clang and kernel. So it's stress tests. We, we, use, we, still, we do that. We could probably send something that measures this. Yeah. So another topic. Would the benchmarks be part of like the self-test suite, or would we have to write a separate, you know, runner that you could set the iterations and like treat it as a proper benchmarking framework? We already have it as part of self-test. There's oh, a bench mark. binary okay. that, that has like a set of different benchmarks, and like you can you can plug into it. Okay, so we just need more. <laughs> and like, well, well, we need like the we have like benchmark infrastructure. We need like the actual benchmark, right? So like it, it has like you can you can like initialize your test and like do something like all the time and like the framework itself measures everything and gives you like throughput per second and stuff like that. But but like simulating the workload and testing everything is up to you, so. All right, so another thing uh, was hashing algorithms. Uh, like kernel and like consequently we in BPF maps and like uh, around BPF code like use jhash, which is kind of old, it's like it was designed in 2006 and like since then we had like 15 years of like people tweaking and tuning and improving hash algorithms. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that the Jenkins hash is not the best hash anymore. Uh, so uh, like, but, but why it's important, right? Like for story from my life, right? Like stack trace, for example, like at some point, like we were running into a lot of hash collisions uh, in production because like we were running like long profiling uh, sessions. And uh, with stack trace, like you have to decide like your, your poison basically with uh, hash collisions. Either you evict the old stack trace and then you sort of like co corrupt previously captured uh, samples or you just like drop the stack trace because you cannot add it. Uh, so like we, we were trying to like play with the size of stack trace uh, map and like made it huge and we still encountered a, quite a significant amount of hash collisions. So like Jenkins hash is not the best hash. We need to have like faster and better hash. Uh, similarly for like bloom filter and like for hash map, right? Like they all use hashing and like if you can improve it, we will improve the performance overall at like wide variety of workloads. Uh, so uh, so the 
kind of the, the theory and like the, the, the question I have is XX hash uh, created by Jan Cole, I don't know, uh, is, is the answer. Because according to some open source benchmarks, it actually is pretty good. And like I, I'll, I'll give you some kind of insight that it's not obvious. Like and as I read a little bit more, I, I realized that, that a lot of those hashes that like you probably heard about, like Murmur and uh, stuff like that, spooky hash, city hash. Uh, they, have, they, they very often have to optimize for like either long inputs or short inputs. And uh, usually like they are good only at one thing, right? So very often like all those benchmarks are done actually on long, uh, long inputs, like file, like basically they optimize for like calculating digest of the file basically, right? Uh, which makes it sort of unsuitable for hash map because usually the, the, the key is, is pretty small. Uh, so like when I actually try, so kernel has uh, xx hash 64, which is like older xx hash. Uh, when I try to plug it into uh, hash map, for example, instead of the Jenkins hash, it actually was slower. Even though it's better hash in terms of like distribution of the values and all that stuff, it was slower because of the short short keys. But it seems like the latest creation from Jan, uh, xx h3, right? It's actually good at both. I don't know how he managed to do that, but it's in this table, by the way, this table is sorted by the bandwidth, by the throughput that can be handled from the top to the bottom. And like you can see, uh, let's say like the spooky hash is like a newer Jenkins hash as far as I understand, right? Like you can see that it's like 50% faster according to this uh, benchmark. And like the, the properties of like the XX hashes is pretty good. Like there's this project, uh, some hasher that tests like the distribution properties and all that stuff. So like this hash has like no, uh, no known problems, let's say, right? So uh, this is the, the benchmark uh, from, from the same Jan, uh, where he shows like how different, uh, different hash uh, algorithms like fair for like relatively short keys. And like XX hash just like blows everyone out of the water, like starting from like four byte long uh, hashes. So haven't found anything better, at least. But we cannot use it because of SSC. We cannot right. use SSC instructions. Well, we need to benchmark a non-SSE implementation. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure there is like non-SSE implementation. Just it might be slower. Yeah. You very specifically mentioned SSE two as well. I don't know why. Was it like using SSE two or? It was probably developed with like the SSE two in mind, like to take maximum advantage of it. Yes. So potentially with later revisions of SSE, it's even faster. Like, <laughs> say it again. SSE four, like we're, we're, if I remember, like the SSE extensions have, they've moved on from two, right? Like, or this is they've reset the numbering scheme since I last revisited this. No idea. Like, uh, I mean, but still, but it would only be for user space. You would need to benchmark the non. Non SSE version. Yeah. Why can't we but it's enlighten me? Like, why can't we use SSE in the kernel? Mm -hmm. SSE is not just about floating point. GCC uses SSE for like a bunch of other. Other thing I remember, but uh, we did this maybe uh, s six years ago in the kernel, <laughs> so it's really long time, where we measured the performance of of the OVS because it also required hashing and it was also using jhash and we implemented the CRC uh, stuff. But this has bias, so in the end, it was reverted again. Um, but it gave a better overall performance. But the thing is, like also to consider like some portions would need architecture specific code as well. Um, but I mean, it's probably doable. And yeah, so and like, I'm like, I don't have any emotional attachment to XSH H3 or whatever, right? Like I, my, my point is like, we should look at like what's available out there. As I said, like 15 years, like people are actually tweaking tune, like there are tons of those hash, hash implementations. They, they are like strong in one regard, maybe like, worse in others. We just need to like, kind of look at this and uh, consider kind of contributing back to the kernel. Uh, like the, the, the XXS, XX 
H64, I think that's what we have in kernel right now. That was added in 2017, like when uh, kernel folks were trying to like add ZSTD support or, or whatever. So like we just, I guess like this is the cry to like let's let's reconsider, like let's maybe bring in like better algorithms that can improve the performance, like you know, without users having to do anything, just magically get better. Uh, That's for TCP, right? Like some of the yeah. TCP and IPv4 and IPv6 has been moving from uh, from Jenkins to Siphash. So that implementation is already there. So it might be easy to, to benchmark. The Siphash. Yep, Siphash. Yeah. Yeah. So like seeing that like you have ten different entries uh, on top of them, like yeah, just pointing out that if, yeah. if you can't rely on SSS, we, we can definitely benchmark, right, yeah. and see if yeah. it gives like immediate benefits, like simple, right? Uh, yeah, so, nice chart. Uh, yeah, I think I told all of that, and this would probably be, make me happy, like, to review, you know, like, if someone has some, some better uh, <laughs> hash implementation. So I highly encourage someone to, you know, take interest, like, do benchmarking. So, and, and the last topic that I wanted to touch on is the evolution of ring buffer, right? Uh, Right now, the ring buffer, like what it allows you to do, it allows you, it's multi-producer single consumer uh, ring buffer, right? Like, and you can submit data only from the kernel, from BPF program, basically, and, and consume it only from the user specs, right? Which is generally what you want. Uh, but I've been thinking about like how we can extend it to allow submitting data from user space into the kernel, right? And I think we can, reuse most of the ideas of like the current implementation, but like maybe add like a little bit more uh, safety checks because right now like we have guarantees that uh, our helpers, BPF ring buff submit, like will properly like set the like record header with proper bits and all this stuff. Once we allow user space to write this, like we cannot trust it, but I think that we can do some minimal amount of checks and like if users space screws up, then like we just don't process data or something. Like the, the idea is like don't, don't crash. Uh, basically, don't go like over like the pre-allocated memory of the ring buffer, uh, but some some of the like what well, this is this is one part like making it uh, work with like user space submitting data, right? Like, but what do you do with this data, right? Like, so the the second part of the proposal is to have like the BPF program of sort of like syscall type, right? Like the the one that runs in like a nice context where you can sleep, you can call syscalls basically and stuff like that, and sort of attach it to the other side of the ring buffer and, and call it for each uh, record. Thankfully, we have like concepts like din pointer in the works so that like the, the, the variable size nature of the ring buffer is not the problem anymore. You can just pass din pointer point into like to a portion of the ring buffer and that's what the BPF program will work on. Uh, some other benefits of this is like you can think about this as like a super generic batch syscall interface, basically, because like you can submit a bunch of requests and only like notify about the data once, like do once a call. Um, so, I think that that would be great to have this because like the, there there are some potential use cases where you would want to uh, kind of initiate work in kernel from the user space, but do it in a fast, low overhead way. And like calling syscall for everything. Like you, you can you can do sort of that with like test run today, for example, right? Like you can just pass custom data to test uh, test run, but you in, incur like a lot of overhead like for each syscall. Well, relatively speaking, this would allow you to do like batching, right? Uh, and then like another extension to, to similar ideas actually to once you allow to have kernel side uh, like BPF program processing uh, ring buffer. Uh, samples, right? You can allow kernel to submit work and then like BPF program on the other side like do like process requests basically, right? With that you, you will be able to basically have like multi-stage servers, right? Like one, one stage accepts, I don't know, SK buff, parses, parses like uh, requests and then like decides that like well let's, let's look up something in the cache, right? But you don't want to do it like in the uh, network processing pass, so like you offload it into ring buffer and like you have another program that does the work and then like, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, I guess two thoughts. It's, it's like, it's always tricky to know if that's good or bad to stage things like that, but okay, fine. Um, the other one is like, so would you have like a doorbell then so you could, you know, queue up a bunch of stuff and then kick it? 
Well, we, we have this right now, right? right. Like, so ring buffer, like it has this default mode of like trying to notify user space as soon as possible unless user space was already notified and hasn't processed right. data. So it's kind of like self-scaling. But then you also uh, have like ability to disable notification or force notification, right? right. So like we just reuse the same thing, right? Well, I like it. It's uh, really useful. You can build full message notification system both ways, right? For example, right now, some fancy stuff we have in uh, Cilium, where we still use the old perf ring buffer, but we can um, queue messages up to user space and then push them even through a Go channel and then to wake up some Go you know, thread. And you can do it like also the other way around where you, and I, I think it's great. We should pursue this. Yeah. And definitely there are- Just a time check because yeah. we- uh, It's the last slide. So like basically like there will be a bunch of different issues that we will need to think through, right? So like one of this is like where do we run this BPF program, right? Like do we allocate like separate case thread for it? Like do we so like for user to kernel space, we can say that like as you do this syscall to notify, you just like process everything in BPF program. But like for kernel to kernel, that's like that's impossible. So like we should at least have the mode where you can say like I want to have like dedicated case thread like that will do this. And then like with dedicated case thread, we can talk about like minimizing the latency and having like the BPF, like kernel basically burning CPU waiting for like the uh, samples to arrive. That That's like probably there are going to be a bunch of discussions uh, and it's not clear like what, what, what are the right combinations that we should allow, but uh, it's just an idea. Um, I, mean, yeah, may, I mean, maybe you would, like just one thought, maybe you would need something like the K-software QD where you just have like one thread per CPU and then you process the, all the different Right, like that... do we share threads? Like do we pull them? Like do we have a dedicated thread? Like do we allow both? How, how do we wire all this in, in API? But yeah, but basically like ring buffer is like a queue. It's pretty fast. It's pretty convenient to work with. Let's generalize it so that we can do more stuff. All right, that's all I had. There is no thanks slide, sorry, I forgot. Thank you.